Hello everyone, my name is Kata and welcome back to my kingdom. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how I made a floor dragger drinkubus tail. This isn't necessarily a tutorial, more or less just kind of showing you how I made this tail. Feel free to take inspiration from what I've done, but obviously do not directly copy this design. So let's go ahead and get started with this video. Okay, so the first thing I'm starting off here is I'm starting with measuring out how big I want the tail to be. Basically what I did is I took the size of the tail on the artwork I drew, and then I kind of figured out how big I wanted the tail to be in real life, and then I scaled the tail up from the image I had. This tail does actually contain a bony tip, like all Dracubus tails, it contains um, five segments on the very end. I want the segmented end to be about one third to one fourth, the total length of the tail. I'm not super picky on the exact measurements just because it really doesn't matter exactly how long or big this tail is, but that's a rough uh, ratio of what I want the tail to be. So basically what I did is I went through and patterned it out. I wasn't actually sure how I wanted to accomplish the bony look. I'm using this vinyl stuff that actually shows a lot of seams, so it is very difficult to hide seams, if not impossible, with vinyl, and I want to be very, very, very careful with where I'm placing these seams, because every single one will show. So I want to limit the number of seams that I have as much as possible. I'm also not entirely sure how I wanted to go about doing the segments of the tail. Since the tail has five different bony segments, I want them all to be distinct enough from each other that they actually look like different segments of the tail. I decided that the fifth segment, the tip of the tail, and the first segment, the one that is actually connected to the fur, were going to be the hardest segments, so I wanted to make sure that I got those down. After a few uh, failed attempts, I found out a way that I really liked. I went ahead and started to repattern these pieces. I realized that I needed a little bit more length on either side and kind of just make them a little bit bigger overall because the pieces were pretty tiny and I didn't want them to be that small, I wanted them to be a little bit bigger. You can see me going ahead and cutting out the last segment, the tip of the bony part to where the bony part can actually connect to the fur of the tail. And basically what I did to connect every single segment is I took uh, two pieces of fabric and put them face to face, so good side to good side, and I sewed a little circle around somewhat the middle of the fabric. It's not exactly the center um, just because it is a circle, and I wanted the center to be cut out. So what I did is I sewed that circle, and then I cut out the center. I realized that these parts were actually going to wind up being somewhat uh, weaker and more vulnerable uh, spots on the tail, so I reinforced them more than I did the rest of the tail just to make sure that they didn't have any issues. Then what I did is I basically took the um, segment part and I sewed one side of these two pieces of fabric together so it created a smaller section in the middle once it was flipped back inside out. The one side that is not sewn to the fifth segment will then be sewn to the fourth segment so that I can then um, continue on this process and just repeat it over and over across all of the different segments for the tip of the tail. After sewing each of the segments to the dividing pieces, I made sure that I trimmed away all of the extra uh, seam allowance. I Normally, if this was fur, it wouldn't really matter if the seam allowance was there or not, especially for a tail, just because you're not going to see it, you're not going to feel it, it's not going to matter. Um, but because this is vinyl and not fur, it acts a lot differently. It's a lot stiffer, and it will show uh, on the outside that there is bunched up fabric. So I went through and I was very careful and trimmed away all of the excess uh, seam allowance to make sure that none of this bunching effect happened. On the first segment, the technically the last one that I made and finished, the one that's going to be connected to the fur, I did not add the dividing segment for where it connects to the fur. I didn't think that it was necessary, um, especially since I plan on using a long pile fur for where it connects, so I didn't see a reason to um, have a divider there. Alright, as you can see here, I am pulling out my computer again with the digital ref sheet pulled up. It's very important that you always have references on hand. Normally I'll have one printed out, but I actually kind of lucked out and was able to use my laptop the entire time so I didn't have to print one. This also allows me to zoom in on specifically what I'm looking at so that I'm only looking at that specific piece. So I can zoom in specifically on the tail here and be able to see it in really good detail. I remeasured the bony part of the tail that I just finished. It actually turned out to be longer than what I was uh, 
originally planning when I first did the ratio. That means the original measurement that I had for the fur part of the tail is going to have to change. So I went through and redid the ratio because I wanted to keep the one fourth to one third the total length ratio still. I had to make the furred part of the tail longer in order to keep it. As you can see here, I'm using newspaper to kind of just get a general idea of what I want. And this is gonna turn out to be my pattern. Okay, so the way that I'm actually doing this tail is going to have three main sections. It's going to have two sections as kind of a right and left, and then the top section that is going to kind of come down and create two seams on either side to create uh, somewhat of a Y uh, seam on the top of the tail. I specifically designed this seam with the location of the spines on the back of the tail in mind. So I wanted to make the spines on the back of the tail as easy to do as possible. I did not want to have to cut holes for each spine once the tail was pretty much finished and all sewn together. I wanted to actually go ahead and sew the spines in as I went so that it created a much neater look and was pretty much easier to do. So that meant creating a seam on the top of the tail that went along the line of the spines. So the spines actually are two rows at the base of the tail. Uh, at that halfway mark where they meet up for the rest of the tail, they are one row. So I made the pattern with this in mind and made two sides on the kind of bottom and sides and then a piece of the top. This will also help kind of create the tail base to be more triangular instead of round uh, because this tail I wanted it to be a little more flat on the top, kind of alligator shape. Once I got the really big basic shape I wanted for the tail, this includes the sh total shape as well as all of the correct measurements and sizes that I need. So uh, after I finished that shape, I went ahead and drew on all of the markings. I actually went through and measured where each of the spines would go. I wanted to make sure that all of the spines in the tail were equally spaced out and then I had enough room to actually put all like eight spines on the back of this tail. This tail had a lot of spines so I wanted to make sure that they all fit. So I actually went through and measured them. Once I measured and marked where I wanted each of the spines to go, I realized this was actually a really good way to figure out where I wanted each of the markings to go because a lot of the markings actually corresponded with where the spines uh, were on the tail. This also stresses the importance of having a really accurate ref sheet because now I can go through and go, okay, I want exactly this marking placement, I want this exact um, spine placement, uh, so on and so forth. This tail actually has tons and tons of pieces. It wound up having, I wanna say over 50 or 60 pieces. You can actually see that I took a piece of printer paper and I kind of drew out a rough shape of the tail as well as all of the markings. This is so that I can label all of the markings uh, with numbers and then later on when I am done cutting out all of the pieces for the fur, I, I can correspond them back to my cheat sheet. So really this next part is me just cutting out all of the fur. There's not a whole lot to say for cutting out fur. Uh, I'm doing this on the floor just because it is where I had the most space and I could actually lay out all of the fur. I don't really recommend cutting things on the floor just because it is bad for your back and I do recommend finding a table that's big enough um, or being able to do it on a table, but unfortunately I'm kind of stuck in a little tiny dorm room and you can pretty much see the entirety of the floor uh, in my room in this video. So that's really much how much space I had to work with. So, and I, and I share this room, so. I edited all of them out, but I did take frequent breaks. So don't think that I was just sitting on the floor for several days straight. I did take several breaks and I stretched my legs out and stood up and moved around, uh, which really did help save my back and legs. But like I said, don't recommend cutting on the floor. For this tail, I have decided that it is going to be straight. Um, because it is a floor dragger tail, I'm not going to actually pattern in any curves or bends into it. I find that this makes the tail look significantly more realistic. It moves better. It looks good on every person, no matter how tall they are. Um, if you pattern in a bend at the bottom of the tail where the tail should be touching the ground, say the person who is wearing it is shorter than that, the bend will look weird and will kind of fold on itself and drag. 
Uh, and then if the person is too tall, the bend in the tail will be really high up, and the rest of the tail after the bend will kind of droop down. Uh, either way, the tail would have to be worn by a person of the perfect height, and then even if that, if the person's pants start to droop down, or maybe they pull up their pants too high, or they're wearing their belt a little bit differently that day, unfortunately the tail is just gonna look really weird and wonky, and it's gotta be perfect all the time in order for bends in a floor dragger tail to look good. Um, so that's kind of the reason why I don't add any kind of bends into the tail. There's just tons of reasons why when I'm making floor dragger tails, I make them long and pretty much perfectly straight. Uh, just gives them a little bit more ability to bend and flex and wiggle freely on their own and more naturally. As you can see, I am laying out all the pieces. Not even close to cutting out all the pieces. I realized that when I laid them all out. It does somewhat feel good when you actually start to kind of see the project come together. And that's just something that I really needed to kind of motivate myself while, you know, continuing to do this. Uh, being able to see the project come together a little bit by little bit, even if it is just laying out all the pieces on the floor or laying out all the pieces on the table and being able to see them kind of coming together, it really, personally, it really helps me. So if you're feeling kind of lacking motivation or you have art block, try doing that. It might, might help you out. The white fur I have is actually too small, so uh, I have plenty here, but I need to cut my piece in half, so I wound up cutting my piece in half. This actually wound up helping me later on because I was able to line up the pieces a little bit better, um, but I did wind up having to cut it in half just so it would fit. So I need to make sure that the pile of my fur is going in the same direction that it should be going. So I can't just willy-nilly lay my patterns down on the fabric, even though it might be the most efficient way to fit all the pieces, if all the pieces are not facing the correct direction, then that doesn't matter and the, the final product will actually wind up looking a little weird and you, you don't want that. So go ahead and make sure that all of your pieces are laying in the correct direction. So you can see here, I am actually finished cutting out all of my pieces. Because there are so many pieces, I wanted to make sure that I had all of them cut out, so I'm laying them all out on the floor. I was also able to uh, leave the pieces on the floor as I was sewing them, so I knew exactly where every piece needed to go and what pieces needed to be sewn to which pieces. Nothing sucks more than realizing that you just sewed two pieces together that did not mean to be together, and now you have to go through and either cut out new pieces or uh, seam rip the two pieces and possibly damage the pieces that you just uh, misplaced. Uh, so now I'm going through and starting to sew the pieces together. Again, there's nothing super special about this. I'm just going through and making sure that I sew all the pieces to the other pieces correctly. Not much to say. I actually get distracted a lot here and unfortunately it's just so much to edit out that I can't really edit all of it out. But yeah, I do get distracted. I, I don't really know what I'm watching, but oh well. You'll also kind of understand why I'm getting so distracted so easily from doing this because it does wind up getting to the point where it's super super tedious and sometimes rather boring um, and I do get distracted a little bit. I remind myself that I've got to keep going and start back up again. These were some teeny tiny stripes. Um, they, they turn out really good, they look really good, but they're very tiny, they're very thin. I actually go through and do everything with a straight stitch and make sure that everything is properly reinforced uh, and won't come undone. Um, some of the places that I think that might be a little more um, 
at risk of popping or having some kind of stress to them, I do uh, reinforce some more, but pretty much all of them will be okay just because tails generally don't have any kind of high stress bendy points. Um, unlike uh, a bodysuit, say, that has like armpits and knees and um, other points in which the person is actually forcing the um, fur to bend, that can create a high stress point. You want to make sure that you really reinforce those points so that they don't pop or come undone too frequently. So I have finished the one side and I'm going through and laying down all of the pieces and I realized that one of the piece was actually cut out incorrectly so I need to cut out a new piece. Don't be ashamed uh, when you realize that you made a mistake and need to correct it. This is something that was super simple and all I needed to do was find the pattern again, cut it out correctly, and then move on. Uh, the piece was actually pretty big so I saved it as a scrap piece uh, with the rest of the fur but uh, sometimes you wind up with little pieces you can't use and unfortunately you do waste but this just kind of goes to show that you need to make sure that you're cutting your pieces out right and if for whatever reason they come out wrong don't be afraid to redo something. So with my new piece cut out I made sure it was correct and laid everything back out uh, and then once I realized that I was all good I, I started to sew everything together again. This tail is symmetrical, so it's the same on both sides, um, but I want to give you a realistic viewpoint of what it's like to actually make a suit, that you have to do both sides. You've got to create every single spine and sew every single one individually, and you have to cut everything out, and how long and tedious everything can realistically be. So you can see here I'm going through and cutting out my uh, spine pieces. This is again the same vinyl that I used for the tip of the tail and I'm just going through and making sure I have all of the pieces that I need. I want to say there were eight in total on this tail. Yeah, yeah, there's eight in total. I realize that they're kind of um, messed up looking, so I bring out an iron and iron the pieces before I start sewing them. This is just because the fabric was kind of wrinkly in storage and I just need to go through and fix it. Nothing a little ironing can't fix. This is me going through and just sewing every individual uh, spine. And then uh, like with the tail, I wanna make sure that the spines don't have any extra seam allowance on the inside that will make them bunch up or bend in any kind of weird ways. So I go through and I trim all of the seam allowance. Then I flip them all inside out just to get a good look at them and I stuff a bunch of them. 
now that I have all of my spines finished and ready to go, what I'm going to do is I am laying all of the pattern pieces down on one of the finished kind of panels of fur uh, for this tail, and I am figuring out exactly where the spines need to be placed on the tail, and I'm going to pin them in place and sew them. Going through, and so now what I'm going to be doing is I'm starting to actually bring the tail together into one big piece, and I'm super excited about this. Um, but what I'm doing is the seam of the spines matches up perfectly with the seam of the fur. So what I have done is I've only sewn half of the spine to the one panel of fur, and then what I'm doing is I'm going through and connecting the top piece of fur to the side piece of fur, as well as the other side of the vinyl. Um, and I'm making sure that in between the fur, vinyl, vinyl, fur, that those two sides do not actually get sewn together. This will prevent the spines from becoming flat. You want to make sure you don't actually sew the base of the spine closed. This will, uh, if you do that, it'll pinch the base of it, and what'll happen is they'll become a lot more wiggly and floppy because there's no support to their base. If you leave it open and actually sew around the edge and don't sew the two sides of the spine closed, you will wind up with um, a wider base, a circular base, and they won't flop around as much. I've left the bottom seam open, so this is so that um, when I go to finish the tail up, I will have uh, underneath of the tail will be where my finishing seam will be. Once I have sewn the bottom seam shut, what I'm doing is I'm taking the bony tip of the tail and I am finally connecting it to the furred part of the tail. So I'm doing this by flipping the fur inside out and then putting the bony part of the tail inside of the fur cone, basically, and sewing the edges of them together. Now that that is on, I can go through and finish stuffing it. Kind of looked at it and made sure it was finished. Uh, and then I started to continue with the seam up the bottom of the tail. Um, now, it was actually pretty difficult because it was kind of a tight squeeze, uh, so I did have to unstuff it a bit, but that's really all I needed to do. I left a gap in the seam in about the middle of the tail on the underside so that I had an access point for flipping it inside out uh, to finish it off by hand sewing it at the very end. All right, so now it is time to create the base of the tail. So basically what I need to do is measure all the way around the tail with the fur so I know exactly how big it is. I did measure a certain amount, I don't remember what it was, but I wanted to make sure that my measurement was accurate. I kind of figured that the base of the tail was a little bit too big, so I went through and kind of ran a few seams to make it a little bit smaller, taper it off a bit. Then I went through and restuffed it and remeasured and got a measurement so I could go through and make a foam base. So the reason why I make foam bases is so that the base of the tail has an actual shape. Because this tail is so big, if I was to just sew on some fabric on the end of it, uh, it would be perfectly round and that is not the shape I want for the base of this tail. I want the base of the tail to be more triangular, uh, so I'm using the foam to kind of give the tail structure at the base. This technique also allows for more secure anchor points for the belt loops as well as while the tail is on the wearer, it actually stays up against the wearer so that um, it doesn't pull away or um, shift in any weird way. I actually realized that this foam piece is a little bit too small, so I cut it down the middle and add some extra foam just to make sure that it is a little bit bigger and it wound up actually being the perfect size and perfect shape. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the foam and I'm going to lay it down on some fabric that I choose to have the base be. You can create you can create some pretty elaborate designs for the base of the tail. I prefer to have the bases of my tail pretty simple just because they don't need to be overly elaborate, um, but there are tons of people who actually go the extra mile and add like bone and inside of tail details on the base of it as if the tail had gotten cut off. Uh, so here I am using two elastic straps and um, sewing it, and I'm using a belt to make sure that the distance uh, in between the two seams is perfectly sized for a regular standard belt. 
what I'm doing here is I am making sure that the fabric uh, for the base of the tail, this dark green fabric, is really, really smooth on the foam. I want to make sure that this is as smooth as possible just so that it looks really nice and clean. I don't want a whole bunch of ridges and crazy mess with the hot glue gun, so I was very careful to only do a little bit of it at a time and to smoothen out the hot glue underneath the fabric in between the fabric and foam. Now, as you can see, I'm going through and starting to attach the base of the tail to the tail itself. And then I'm going around and trimming the extra off of it, uh, just because I don't need to have a whole bunch of extra. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to pin this lycra, the fabric I'm using for the base of the tail, to fur so I can go ahead and sew these two things together. A lot of people opt to hand sew this part, but uh, personally, again, I don't like to hand sew things. I want to make sure that I can machine sew as much as possible, so I'm doing this in a fashion in which I can machine sew it. I feel like it always turns out looking way better if it's machine sewn. Uh, I realize that the foam is actually too thick for my machine. I'm not sewing through the foam, I'm sewing next to the foam, but it is still too thick to actually fit underneath my machine. So I take off one of the layers of the foam, because uh, this is uh, one inch foam and there's two pieces of one inch, so it's two inches thick. And that's just too thick to go under my machine, so I uh, take off the one layer and then later on I go through and um, just glue that piece back on. There. For big tails like this, uh, I prefer to add two inches uh, for the base of the tail. I might even actually go a little bit thicker than that, depending on the tail and what I want to do with it, um, because a lot of times the longer the tail is or the bigger the tail is, the more support it needs at the base. Having the foam at the base of the tail be thicker gives it more uh, structure. Smaller tails, of course, do not need this and may or may not wind up with one or two inches of foam. I am now going through and, and re-gluing the foam that I removed back into its place. Once I am finished gluing these pieces back on, I actually go and uh, start to kind of fold the fur back into its place, and I start to glue it to the edges of the base of the tail just so it stays. Um, this isn't really necessary, but it's something that I do just to kind of make sure that none of the fur shifts. Again, not necessary just because it is sewn in place, but something I personally like to do. This is something I regretted doing uh, a little bit later on, but you'll see in a minute why. So once I have flipped this entire thing inside out, I start to stuff it. Um, I believe that I'm actually starting to get to the point where I'm almost done with this tail. I'm actually super excited, uh, and I do a test wear. It's super important that you always do test wears on your products before you uh, finish them off completely uh, just to make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen. So this tail was almost finished, but unfortunately in this test wear this shows the backing and it's, it's actually pretty bad um, and I, I find this to be kind of unacceptable because I wanted it to be more or less um, up kind of like this uh, and unfortunately it doesn't do that it, it droops down a lot and it pulls on your pants so the rest of it works good it wiggles good but this this here just won't do so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to fix that so unfortunately I'm gonna have to go through and unstuff the entirety of this tail and cut off and rip out the base um, I actually don't have a seam ripper on hand, so I'm going to have to go through and actually cut this base back off of the tail. So I have to go through and rip all of this hot glue that I put around the edge and start to um, slowly go through and cut away at this seam on the edge of the tail. So I was trying to be as careful as I could to make sure that I didn't mess up any of the fur, just because it is the most expensive part. I really don't want to remake the entirety of this tail. I wind up actually only having to rip off the um, dark green fabric from the foam, and I actually reused the foam pieces I had. So I actually wound up not having to waste a whole lot uh, other than my time with uh, doing this.
again, this is just to kind of show you that uh, even people who are experienced with fursuit making do mess up sometimes, and it is important that you realize that you mess up, and if it's something that you need to fix, go ahead and fix it. Uh, and then I realized that there's a lot of hot glue on those parts where I put the hot glue, and unfortunately, I cannot put uh, hot glue through my sewing machine. The needle will not go through um, the hardened hot glue. It will mess up my machine, it'll mess up my needle, um, and that's really with any sewing machine. It will mess up your machine and your needle. You need to make sure that fabric that has hot glue on it does not go through your machine. No matter if it's hot or dry, um, it will mess up your machine. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually uh, doing a little trick that I learned. Um, this only really works with the backing of fur, not the front. I am using the tip of a warmed up hot glue gun. to. It'll kind of get to the point where it will uh, separate from the fur. Uh, so this is making sure that I don't actually rip the fur. So I'm going to um, warm up the glue just a little bit and then use my finger to kind of wipe away the, the glue once it is warm and, and sticky again. So hot glue will warm back up after you have uh, had it sit. Uh, it does not cure. So hot glue is not a curing thing. It will heat back up even years after uh, you've already applied it. So this is something you need to take in consideration when making fursuits that you don't want to leave a fursuit head in like a hot car that could warm up the glue to the point where pieces could fall off or um, moving jaws might not work anymore because the glue has come undone. I'm using this trick to my advantage to get this hot glue off of this fur so I can put it back through my sewing machine and pretty much just just redo the base uh, the same way that I did before, just with a different placement of straps. I'm being very careful and picking away at this hot glue. Uh, I do not need all of it off. Uh, I only need just enough around the edge so that I can put this through a sewing machine, and that's really the only thing that I need to accomplish, is have just enough uh, seam allowance of the fur so that I don't wind up getting any hot glue on my needle or my machine. All right, so now I'm actually going to be taking the fabric base off of this foam base. I wanna reuse the foam because I do really like its shape. Uh, so I'm gonna carefully remove the fabric because I cannot use it and this entire fabric piece is trash. Really, in reality, this is the only thing that I'm having to trash from this mistake. Uh, and I'm just going to go through and recut a new piece. I'm using the same fabric just because there is no need to use a different type of fabric. Uh, I like this color and I'm lining um, the head and the hand paws with this fabric so I think it'll make it match really well. So what I've decided is I'm going to be using um, this webbing instead of elastic. So I think another issue that I had was that the elastic was giving too much stretch uh, and it was pulling away from my belt too far and that was not good. So I don't want any stretch on this. Um, normally with much smaller tails, you may want to use elastic to try to give it a little bit of bounce but this tail just does not need bounce. It has enough wiggle and enough bounce on its own that by giving it elastic, the only thing that's doing is um, weighing it down. The weight of the tail is just going to pull that elastic down and you don't want that. So I'm gonna be using non-stretchy webbing here to kind of avoid that issue. I'm also going to be placing them higher up on the base of the tail, pretty much at the very, very, very top. So I don't wind up with the top drooping just because it is being supported by the top of the tail. I'm pulling out my belt again just so that I can uh, make sure that I have the correct width and uh, as you can see I am making it at the very 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 top of the base of the tail. Um, it looks like the bottom just because I have it flipped upside down but that's so that I can work on it. Uh, that is actually the top. Uh, I've also opted to add four straps instead of two this time. Hopefully this will give me enough um, hopefully this is going to give me enough uh, support that I will not have to redo this base again. kind of angled the two um, side edges in so that I have uh, kind of a more round uh, base. I just want to make sure that it fits on a belt really well so by angling them uh, it's kind of giving a little bit more room for the tail to kind of curve with the shape of the wearer. 
going through and reinforcing all of the edges just to make sure that they will not come undone. This is a really, really important part. I'm probably not going to be able to fix these by hand sewing uh, if they do happen to come undone, uh, so I'm making sure they won't ever come undone by really reinforcing them. And I'm checking my belt again just to make sure that it's big enough. Nothing sucks more than finishing a tail and realizing that the loops you made for your belt don't actually fit. So again, I'm doing the same technique as I did before with um, going very, very carefully and only adding a little bit of hot glue uh, every so often so I can make sure it is perfectly smooth. I want to make sure that this fabric looks really, really smooth on this foam uh, just so that it isn't wrinkly. I also realized that the um, triangle that I've made here, or this uh, foam base I've made here, is actually kind of lopsided, so I'm adding a little bit to this corner to kind of counteract that. Another reason why I'm grateful for um, having to redo the base of this tail. Uh, I'm not cutting out the time in which I am waiting here just because I'm actually holding the pieces down for the hot glue. So this is something that is realistically, uh, if you're gluing a bunch of foam together, you will be sitting there for several minutes waiting on it to dry. Now that I am finished with gluing it down, I know now that I need to actually remove the second layer of the base just so I can run this thing through the sewing machine, and I'm going to attempt to do the same thing here. I'm not actually putting the foam in the machine, it is not going under the needle. Uh, only the two pieces of fabric on either side of the foam is going through the actual needle of the sewing machine. Um, and it's super, super close to the foam. Uh, the way that my machine is set up, it has extra parts that actually hold the needle, uh, and that comes down. And that is only about an inch above all of my workspace where the needle is. So I need to make sure that the foam actually fits underneath of that and doesn't interfere with all of the moving mechanical parts that my machine consists of. So I actually went through and restuffed this tail and um, pinned it up and did a test run, did a test wear. I actually liked it so far, so I'm going to continue. I wanted to make sure that I didn't finish all the way through um, with making the base of this tail and then realize that it is also uh, messed up and then I have to redo it. Um, so this is kind of a prototyping uh, stage right now with me testing it and making sure it was going to work. So I liked it, so I'm going to continue and finish sewing all of the edges together. At moments like this, it, it really makes me wish I had uh, three or four hands because that really would have helped with holding the foam down and helping guide it through and making sure I had another hand to make sure none of the fur came unstuffed and so on and so forth, but it's whatever. Now I'm going through and re-gluing those pieces back onto the base of the tail so that it's now two inches instead of uh, just the one like it was through the machine. Okay, so now that I have finished with the base, I'm going to go and actually glue down these little tabs. Uh, so I left extra uh, of the strapping to be able to go up into the tail uh, so I can kind of wrap it around the foam and give it a little bit more support. So this is what I'm kind of doing with the 
um, extra little tabs that I have here as I'm going through and gluing them down to help reinforce these straps. Once they are finished, I start to flip the tail inside out. I opted to not glue the fur onto the edges of the foam base this time, just because I know that it really isn't needed, and I wasn't really doing it before for any reason. I also didn't want to risk uh, having to redo the base again and having to cut the fur again, um, but luckily I didn't have to do that. So I'm going through and once more stuffing this tail again. Now what I'm doing is I am clipping the access hole on the underside of the tail closed so I can go ahead and kind of do some test uh, wears on this tail just to make sure that the base of it is sufficient as well as any other part of the tail uh, isn't faulty or defective or anything so that I don't close it off and finish it without making sure the tail is actually done. I did a few test wears and determined that the tail was finished so what I'm doing now is I am going to hand sew this hole closed. For the purposes of this hole, I am using a hidden stitch. This is also called a ladder stitch. Basically, the way that you are putting the needle through the fabric, or the fur in this case, uh, when you pull the when you pull the uh, thread tight, uh, the two sides of the fur will come together and will completely hide the thread. This helps create the illusion that there isn't actually a seam there. Um, this isn't necessarily needed with a long pile of fur like this, just because the pile tends to hide seams, um, but with other fabrics, uh, a hidden stitch will work wonders. I will leave a link in the description below to a tutorial on, on how to do a hidden stitch. And voila, once I am finished, I brush the whole thing out and I am done. So here is a little video of what it looks like finished looks super good. It has a really good wiggle. It moves really naturally. You can really wiggle the heck out of this tail and it's going to look adorable. And that brings us to the end of my video on how I made this Floor Dragger Dracubus tail. If you like this video, uh, you're probably going to like my future videos when I make the suit head and the paws for this character. Um, so go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on those future videos. They will be coming out relatively soon, so keep your eyes peeled. And until next time, guys, remember, my name is Kata, and you are always welcome back in my kingdom.